Greetings fellow learners. In this video, we are going to see why convolution networks work so well for images. So let's say that we're dealing with an image classification problem. We have an artificial neural network that's going to take some image of an alphabet and it's going to output the classification of what that alphabet is. So what should this network look like? Well, why not just use, let's say, a feed-forward neural network? In this case, we would say input an image of like 16 cross 16, where individual pixel values can be either 0 or 1. We can flatten it out, make that 256 neurons, and then pass it into one of tw these 26 neurons over here, which are 26 classes from A to Z. Now, during the model training phase, let's say that we, you know, continuously pass these samples in. So maybe for this first sample, we'll see that, you know, we have like a prediction of one for class A. Then over here, there's going to be like another neuron over here for class B, that would be one. And then same as previously, where we have a class B, one over here. And at this point, let's just say that the training error that we get from training this model is zero. Now, this sounds good, but we notice that the generalization error is still poor. So if we pass in like an unseen example, we're gonna see that maybe like the recognition of A is 0 0.11, but that of Z is 0 0.58, which is a poor prediction. So why is generalization still poor here? Well, this network is characterized by a large number of parameters. We have 256 times 26, whatever, a few thousand that may be. Now, the large number of perfect solutions thus exists during training. So because training error is zero, there may be many possible configurations of these parameters that yield this zero error training. And so every time you were to probably train this network, you might get a different model altogether. And so you get very different types of predictions for the same input on different iterations of training. And this can overall lead to very poor generalization results. And a lot of this is mostly because this model has kind of memorized what the training data is. And in this case, it just might be averaging what the training data is, and this is like a classical case of overfitting. So how do we deal with this? Well, one way that we can deal with this is we can just reduce the number of parameters in a network. So in this case, we can do this by like pruning some of these edges. Maybe if there were extra layers in here, we can also do some regularization techniques. And all in all, we just want to decrease the number of parameters. But even when we train and then do some model inference here, we'll see that we may still get a poor model. You can see for an input A, like the input for A is still like low, for example. And so that's an indication of poor performance. But again, why is generalization here still poor? Well, this is now a different problem of the model can no longer represent the desired function. And so this is like a classical case of underfitting. And so in summary, what we're seeing is that the network should not have too many parameters, that multiple solutions to the training data exist, and hence data is memorized, classical case of overfitting. But then we should also have a network that doesn't have too few parameters that it will not be able to represent the desired function, underfitting. Aside from trying to fine-tune a regularization strategy, how do we effectively deal with this? Well, we had Jan LeCun in 1988 who proposed that if you know something about a task, then you should try to encode this into the architecture of the network. And in this case, well, we have a network which has an input of an image. Images have pixels, and individual pixels are related and they have spatial relationships with pixels that neighbor it. And so what we could use then is like, well, a convolution layers can be used to understand these relationships. 
So we can probably use that in our network, like so. But now this A can be here, or it can be here, or it can be here. So it can be translated in different parts of the images. How do we deal with that? Well, it doesn't really matter because convolutions can detect these translations. They are translation equivariant. And specifically, when we have convolution layers, they are going to use a sliding window to look for certain features in every part of the image. So no matter where in the image, you know, the A exists, it is still going to be detected by the convolution features. But if A is slightly shifted, then the features that are detected by the convolution operator operation are also shifted. And this is why we say that it is translation equivariant with respect to the input. But interestingly, in order to make sure this output is still unchanged despite the translation, we can use something called pooling, right? So pooling layers, particularly in deeper parts of the network, they have large receptive fields. So that means that they're able to see like larger swaths of the image itself. And the operation of pooling, like when we do a max pooling or an average pooling, is to summarize these large parts of the input image. And what this allows is the classification to be invariant, this classification output to be invariant with respect to translation. So that means that no matter where this A lies, whether it's here or like here or here, it wouldn't really make too much of a difference because the pooling operation is going to summarize large parts of the image and it should still be able to detect the same A. And so convolution and pooling can work quite well together in order to deal with this translation issue. And so we can add it to our network. But what if the A changes in width by a little bit because of uneven pen strokes, kind of like what we're seeing here? Well, this is still fine because the pooling operation ensures the output is invariant to pixel level noises. So like I mentioned before, pooling, especially in deeper layers, is going to look at large parts of an image. So let's say that a pooling operation is looking at this part of the image and is going to summarize what it sees here. Whether it's a thicker pen stroke or this thinner pen stroke, it shouldn't really make a difference in what information is summarized because it's looking at just this entire region itself. So it becomes invariant to pixel level noises and hence downstream operations would still predict the same class as, you know, A, so it's invariant. So that's fine. But what about the issue where, you know, we have a lot of parameters like we saw in the original feed forward case? Would this still lead to like a memorization and overfitting? Well, in this case, convolution layers use something called a weight sharing. So we have different convolution filters that, you know, will be sliding the same filter, which is the same exact set of weights across the entire image. So the weights are going to be shared, essentially. And this significantly reduces the number of parameters that are used during training. Pooling also does not really add learnable parameters at all. When we're doing a max pooling, we're kind of just taking a max, and it's not really adding any learnable parameters. It also downsamples the input, enabling fewer parameters in later layers. So all in all, pooling doesn't add parameters and it actually helps even diminish it further too. So we don't have the issue with a lot of parameters. But then what about the issue then with too few parameters? Wouldn't this lead to an underfitting issue that we described previously? Well, not really because the network now extracts much higher quality features as it takes advantage of the fact that the input is an image. So the convolution is gonna extract you know, spatial relationships with respect to pixels, which is very image specific and it works quite well because it's an image. And the pooling layer is going to work in order to make sure that you know, small changes and also translations you know, don't affect this output. And so we find that such networks generalize quite well. 
And specifically, you know, if we can take like, um, this is an excerpt from a 1988 paper that conducted a few experiments in this way. So these first two are going to be like feed forward neural networks. And we can see that their, you know, test or generalization performance is going to be less than the networks here, which consist of convolution layers on the same data set. And it's important to note that this generalization performance is higher despite having far fewer parameters than the feed forward networks. So convolution networks have better generalization performance despite fewer learnable parameters. So what we've kind of seen so far with like some of the advantages of having these layers are that convolution layers they reduce the number of learnable parameters in the network via weight sharing. They allow the network to learn spatial relationships between pixels and their neighbors. And they also account for image translations. Pooling layers reduce the number of learnable parameters in future layers of the network via downsampling. It ensures the output is translation invariant and it ensures the output is invariant to pixel level variations. This is what we saw previously. So if I were to summarize overall this video, four image processing problems using a combination of convolution and pooling operations, a neural network can learn high quality features from images while simultaneously slashing the number of learnable parameters. This allows the network to generalize better with the added benefit of reducing the cost to train models. And I hope at least at a high level, this now answers the broad question of why convolution networks work so well for images. Quiz time. Have you been paying attention? Let's quiz you to find out. Which of the following statements are true for pooling in convolution networks? A. If the input is translated, the result of pulling is also translated by the same amount. B. In later layers, they are characterized by large receptive fields. C. It summarizes results of previous convolution layers. Or D. Their downsampling can reduce the number of learnable parameters in later layers. Note that multiple options here may be correct, and I'll give you a few seconds to answer this question. The correct options are B, C, and D, but can you tell me why? Please provide your reasoning down in the comments below and let's have a discussion. And at this point, if you think I do deserve it, please do consider giving this video a like because it will help me out a lot. And that's gonna do it for quiz time, but before we go, let's generate a summary. So we took a look at why convolution networks work so well for images. We saw that there could be potential issues of too many parameters that could lead to the model memorizing training data, but also too few parameters that the model is not able to represent the desired function. And so we need to somehow balance these two issues. Now, one way to deal with this is take advantage of the fact that we have input images and we want to encode this fact into the architecture of the neural network. And so we make use of convolution layers and pooling layers for these reasons over here. We also saw that in summary for image processing problems, using a combination of these operations, a neural network can learn high quality features from images while simultaneously slashing the number of learnable parameters. And this allows the network to generalize better with the added benefit of reducing cost to train models. And that's all I have for today. If you think I do deserve it, please do consider giving this video a like and to continue your AI journey, do check out these videos right over here and I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.